This is a disclaimer for the upcoming video. The case of Catherine Knight is a brutal one, and if you are uncomfortable with discussions of murder and pretty much anything extreme beyond that, then feel free to skip the video. If you are okay with what I will be discussing in this video, then please go ahead and I hope you enjoy. When we think of the worst of crimes that a human can commit, our minds tend to be turned towards serial killers or people who have committed crime on a mass scale. But this is not always the case, as sometimes just a single horrendous crime can put multiple others to shame. Such is the case with the topic of today's video, Catherine Knight, the first woman in Australia to be sentenced to life without parole, destined to spend the rest of her natural life behind bars, with no hope of leaving the prison that has become her home. Catherine was born on the 24th of October 1955 in a town called Tenterfield in New South Wales, Australia, to quite a dysfunctional home. She was born out of an affair that her mother had had with one of her husband's co-workers. Her mother, Barbara Ruffin, was married to a man named Jack Ruffin, having four children with him before Knight ever came into the picture. Her affair was with a man named Ken Knight, and when the affair was finally revealed, they faced a lot of backlash in the community, leading Barbara and Ken to leave town. Barbara and Ken had a further four children together, which included a set of twins, one of which was Catherine, who ended up taking her father's surname. In 1959, Jack Ruffin passed away, and two of his children moved in with Barbara and Ken. Ken was not a kind man, and his relationship with Barbara was very unstable. Ken would often sexually assault Barbara, and she would often speak with her daughters about sex, warning them against men, and not hiding much in terms of the abuse she was facing. Catherine herself claims to have been abused by her family for years, which only stopped when she turned 11. Despite this, she claims that her father was not one of the people who abused her, despite his treatment of her mother. These claims have some doubt in regards to specific details, but the overall claims about Catherine's abuse in her early years have been accepted and confirmed. Catherine was also quite proud of her Aboriginal familial roots, and out of her family there was one person she was close to, her uncle, who tragically took his own life in 1969, distressing Catherine. Catherine's school life was also quite troubled, as she was described as a loner in high school and would often bully her fellow students, being violent towards them, and, on one occasion, a teacher. Despite her violent tendencies, she was overall seen as a model student, and when she wasn't in a rage, she was described as pleasant and well behaved. When she was 15, she left school, despite at that point being unable to read or write. Shortly afterwards, she got a job at a clothing factory, but left after a year to work at an avatar, describing it as her dream job, a grim foreshadowing to her enjoyment of violence. She was promoted quickly due to her skill, and was even gifted a set of butcher's knives, something she treasured dearly and would keep hung up above her bed should she ever need them. Knight met a co-worker at her avatar named David Kellett. Kellett was equally as troubled and had developed a heavy drinking habit due to a couple of traumatic experiences in his life. These habits are what led him to work at the avatar as he had lost his previous job due to the drinking. The two hit it off almost immediately, and they were married after only a year of being together. Apparently on the day of their wedding, Knight's mother warned Kellett of her daughter's violent tendencies, something Kellett would learn of quite soon. On the night of their wedding, after having sex only three times, Knight tried to initiate intercourse for a fourth time, but when Kellett was unwilling, Knight attempted to strangle him. Luckily, Kellett was able to fight Knight off, 
but this was only the start of the abuse he would face within the marriage. The marriage was very violent, primarily on Knight's behalf, as she would often physically attack Kellett during any arguments they may have had. One night, when Knight was pregnant, she attacked Kellett with a frying pan and burnt all of his clothing, all because he had come home late from a darts tournament. In fear, Kellett fled to a neighbour and called the police. Charges were considered by the police, but Kellett eventually dropped them after some convincing from Knight. The couple had their first child, Melissa Ann Knight, in 1976, and shortly afterwards Kellett left the family and moved to Queensland with another woman. This act was heavily unfaithful, but is somewhat understandable as Knight's abuse was consistent and unrelenting. After Kellett had left, Knight spent weeks in the hospital being treated for postnatal depression following an incident with her baby. When Knight was discharged from hospital, she wasted no time in trying to dispose of her child, leaving her helplessly on some train tracks. Luckily, the baby was saved by someone nearby and Knight was arrested, being sent back to the hospital. Knight apparently recovered in record time, however, and was able to sign herself out the very next day. A few days after leaving the hospital, Knight decided to try and pursue Kellett, attacking a woman and trying to force her to drive her to Queensland. The woman escaped at a service station and called the police. However, when the police arrived, Knight had already taken a hostage. After a short encounter, the police were able to corner and disarm Knight, taking her to the Morissette Psychiatric Hospital. Knight revealed in a later evaluation that she had been planning to kill multiple people in her pursuit of Kellett, but this concerning fact was not treated with much severity and was pretty much ignored. After hearing about the incident, Kellett decided to move back in with Knight in order to support her. Knight was released from the mental institute on the 9th of August 1976 and moved with Kellett and his mother to Ipswich in Brisbane. She started working at another avatar as her skills were highly revered and she had another daughter in 1980. Knight left Kellett in 1984 and moved back to Aberdeen for a short while moving to Muswellbrook shortly afterwards. She promptly returned to work, but after about a year, she injured her back and went on disability. A notable fact is that the government gave Knight a housing commission residence in Aberdeen, where she lived shortly after leaving work. Knight's other relationships were less notable than what would come later, but the signs of her mental state were still prevalent early on. She met a 38-year-old miner in 1986, going by the name David Saunders. Saunders moved in with Knight roughly a year later in 1987, and Knight would often show extreme violence and jealousy towards Saunders, and in one horrendous occasion, killed his pet dingo right in front of him for no reason other than to be a threat of what she would do to him if he were ever unfaithful. The couple had a daughter in 1988, and Saunders started to put money towards buying a house for the family. However, after an argument, Knight viciously attacked Saunders, leading him to move away for a while. He eventually returned to find all of his clothing cut up, and promptly left again, going into hiding to get away from Knight. Eventually, Saunders returned once again, but he found that Knight had issued an apprehended violence order against him, which is basically the equivalent of a restraining order, undoubtedly based off of false claims, but this act ended up preventing Saunders from re-entering Knight's life. In 1991, Knight had a son with a co-worker, but this is less notable as after a three-year-long relationship with this man, she left him for another man, who went by the name of John Price.
When Pratt began his affair with Knight, he already knew about her violent reputation, but the two got along and so they continued their relationship. Knight eventually moved in with Price and his two children in 1955. The couple often had disagreements, but life was relatively peaceful at first, until 1998, when the two began arguing over Price's refusal to marry Knight. In response to this argument, Knight orchestrated a plan to get Price fired from his place of work, a strategy which ended up working, leading to Price kicking Knight out of their home. The two restarted their relationship a few months later, but this time Price refused to let Knight move in with him, much to her dismay. Needless to say, the arguments continued and grew, slowly reaching a boiling point. In February of 2000, Knight attacked Price, stabbing him in the chest. And for Price, this was the absolute limit. He kicked her out once again and took out a restraining order against her on the 29th of February. After this, Price heavily feared for his life, even telling his co-workers that if he did not come into work the next day, it would be because of Knight. His co-workers were obviously concerned upon hearing this, but Price knew that if he did not return home, his children might be at risk, so he left for home after work. After returning home, Price noticed that his children were absent, apparently having been sent to stay the night at a friend's house, apparently on the behalf of Knight. Later in the night, when Price was asleep, Knight arrived at his home, woke him up, and the two ended up having sex shortly afterwards. When morning finally came around, however, one of Price's neighbours noticed that he had not left for work leading to some concern. Price's employer also noted his absence and sent a co-worker to his house to check on him. The neighbour and Price's co-worker tried knocking on Price's bedroom window, thinking he may have slept in, but once they noticed the blood on the floor of the house, they decided to phone the police. The police arrived shortly afterwards and broke down the back door, only to be met with a grisly scene. The police discovered what remained of Price's body, along with an unconscious knight, who had taken a large amount of pills, in what I would assume as a suicide attempt, one that was unsuccessful. After Knight had slept with Price the previous night, it was determined that she had attacked him with one of her butcher's knives, stabbing him a total of 37 times. Price obviously woke up during the attack and tried to escape, but was unable to eventually bleeding out in the hallway. Hours after Price had passed away, Knight used her butcher's skills to skin him and hunt said skin from a meat hook. Knight then proceeded to decapitate Price, placing his head in a pot to boil. She also cut parts off of Price and cooked them, intending to turn them into a meal. The dining room table was set specifically for Price's children, which meant that she had intended to feed them their own father. Price's body was also staged in a way that showed Knight's clear contempt for him. Along with the bloody crime scene was an accusatory note targeted towards Price, but after analysis and the eventual trial, the contents of the note were found to be groundless. And so we move on to the main topic, the trial of Catherine Knight. Knight was obviously arrested for Price's murder, and when the time came, she attempted to plead guilty to manslaughter. However, this plea was rejected, and the trial went forward, with Knight being charged with first-degree murder on the 2nd of March 2001. Knight initially pled not guilty to this, and the trial was set for the 23rd of July. However, due to some circumstances, it got moved up to the 15th of October. Due to the graphic nature of this crime and the evidence to be presented in court, five prospective jurors chose to opt out of the trial and more opted out later on. 
Once the jury was impaneled, however, all of this trouble was in vain, as Knight decided to change her plea to guilty, and the jury was dismissed. The reasons for this change are not known, as Knight still refused to accept responsibility for the crime. But my best assumption is that her legal team was trying to get a reduced sentence through a guilty plea. Multiple psychiatric evaluations were held to determine if Knight was mentally fit to plead guilty with the knowledge of what that meant and what that would entail moving on. Her legal team claimed that Knight had amnesia and was suffering from dissociation. Claims that were somewhat supported and two separate psychiatrists determined that Knight had BPD, Borderline Personality Disorder. Regardless of these facts, however, Knight was found fit to stand trial. One notable fact is that upon hearing the graphic details of the crime in court, and upon seeing the evidence, Knight became hysterical and had to be sedated. This can be perceived in a few ways, by saying that Knight genuinely was not in the right state of mind during the murder. But in my personal opinion, she knew her fate was sealed, and there was no way that she could escape punishment for her crime. And on the 8th of November, Catherine Knight was sentenced to life in prison without parole, a historical event as she was the first woman in Australian history to be given this punishment. Knight tried to appeal the sentence in June of 2006, claiming that a lack of chance for parole was far too severe of a punishment for the crime. This appeal was swiftly denied, of course, and to this day, Catherine Knight is still imprisoned at the Silverwater Women's Correctional Centre. Catherine Knight's case is truly a horrendous one, as it is not only an extreme act of violence, one that makes the likes of some serial killers look mild, but also a clear example of incompetence on the behalf of the judicial system surrounding her. The act of violence committed against John Price was not the first time Knight had shown her violent tendencies. Her relationships before all showed signs of abuse. And while some may be chalked up to people too afraid or unwilling to report her to the police, there were other cases where the police actively arrested Knight on multiple occasions, only for her to receive a slap on the wrist or even a few months in a mental hospital, even for the crime of almost killing one of her own children. Overall, this terrible crime serves as an example of just how depraved a human can be and a possible example of how one's surroundings growing up could lead to disastrous consequences later on. I am the investigator, and if there is any morbid or lesser known crimes you would like to hear a video on, please let me know in the comments. I have a friend of mine to thank for this video, and without her input, I would not have even known about Catherine Knight. I hope you all enjoyed the video, and if you did, please leave a like, and consider subscribing for more content. I am unsure when the next video will be up, but rest assured that the wait will be worth it. Until next time!